All right. I am here with Helen Guillaume, and she is the founder and CEO of Wild AI. How's it going, Helen? I'm very good. Thanks for having me, Steve. Yeah, I'm excited to really unpack your story and everything. But before we get into that, let's talk about your background. What got you into business and entrepreneurship? So I studied mathematics and financial risk. I was a quant in a hedge fund and a management consultant in AI. That's how I started my career. And I was, a lot of people say they've always been entrepreneurial. I don't think that was the case for me. Um, I did have a boss uh, when I was in the hedge fund who was young, had built his own company. And I thought like, if he can do it, I can do it too. So that was really inspiring for me. Um, but yeah, I when I started working, I think I was quite arrogant. I wanted to do things that I was not asked to do. Like for instance, when I was a consultant, I wanted to pitch and get new clients, but then I would probably not do my groundwork. And so my employers were not extremely impressed by me, uh, to say the least. And so, and I, I was trying to, to find some other stuff. So I looked at many different small, like shitty ideas, but on the way. And, uh, and then eventually, um, I'm, uh, I'm also an athlete. I've, I was always competitively doing sports, triathlon, swimming, rugby, and now I'm a very, uh, enthusiastic amateur surfer and doing a lot of sports. I, I could see a lot of, uh, pain points for me as a woman. I thought it wasn't cool to be a woman in sports. You know, we're less fast, less strong. And the Holy Grail is that man, uh, but I was never going to become that. So I was trying to find an answer to my insatisfaction in being a woman in sports and being not portrayed in media because we're not interesting and I was like this is actually really unfair and not okay and then I, re I started to look like are there any adventures of being a woman and that's how I got really started into wild AI which uh, what we do is uh, research on the female body which we translate into our app helping women eat and train with their menstrual cycle um, and then the flip side of that is a coach dashboard so coaches can also train women according to that. And the underlying tech that feeds that can also feed third party apps, wearables, we have an API integration and that's us, our wild AI. Nice. Very cool. So how do you see sort of the intersection of, of being an athlete? and management because as the ceo of, a, of an ai startup you know there's a lot of uh, things that that come up that you may not have expected even as you know a, a consultant and things like that it, it's pretty pretty difficult so what type of overlap could you share with us in terms of like athletics as a women as a woman and and management I think it's, it's it's huge actually. I think resilience and learning, but I think one one really core point is this very um, intricate relationship between failure and success. Uh, like there isn't any sport at all that exists without what we call failure in business, and we don't necessarily call it failure in sports. Uh, I mean, if if you are competing, maybe like for instance, if you are a tennis player. Uh, you cannot play tennis at all if you cannot like digest not succeeding and not being the winner. It, it's it literally it's impossible. And if you're surfing, surfing is like you paddle, 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 and you have to get out of the wave. You have to fall and you have to. So in sports, it's so intricately correlated these achievements and then getting smashed by wave of, or like not succeeding. So failing in sports. And, and I think we see it in many, uh, like in many competitions uh, in a very tense match uh, when you so start seeing really the mental resilience of the athletes playing such an important role. Like if they start winning, they become very confident. And if they start losing, it's actually really, really hard to actually get back to a stronger position because their self-worth go down goes down and I think for me like doing sports I've had that all my life and I had massive setbacks I had injuries but I also did, didn't win for most of my life and I think in in uh, in business we see failure as a way I think that is somehow way worse and I think the the underlying feeling as a human is shame and I think shame is such a um, a feeling that 
we are extremely uncomfortable to deal with or I am very uncomfortable to deal with it's you know like this feeling in when you're a small child in the, in the in the room and kids mock you and this this feeling that I think I I really uh, dread and I think in business in in sports it's definitely there like I'm not going to do that and we hide between words like mm, I'm actually lazy. I'm not going to do it. But the reason I want to do it is not because I'm that lazy, it's because actually I really fear doing it. So I'd rather call me myself lazy than uh, do it and fail. And in business, I think what I learn, I'm still learning a lot is how to go beyond this fear of shame of ex- being exposed to shame and still do things and do actions. And so now what I'm trying for me, a successful day is actually having this sensation of shame because it means that if I put myself out there, I have got myself into out of my comfort zone and it will very and most of the time lead to failure or shameful situation, but sometimes also lead to success. Mm -hmm. I like that. The adversity of of surfing, getting crushed by a big wave (laughs) can, can teach you a lot of lessons when, when building a business for sure. So you're you're on the board of I believe it's women in sports tech, and I was doing some research on that, and I think that that's a really cool initiative. If we could talk a little bit about that, and then dive into some advice uh, that you could give for for women entrepreneurs listening to this. But first, let's unpack that. What what is it, and and what does it involve? Yeah, I'm an advisor there, and it's an incredible organization that actually funds financially a person to join a company, a startup or a company in sports um, to do a placement, a, a work placement. So they are funded by Women Sports Tech and they can, the person can either find a company or uh, they are placed in a sports company. And what it gives uh, women um, as an opportunity is to start working in a, in a startup or, or, or a sports company. So we had, for instance, one of our best employees that she, she was so eager and she reached out to me on LinkedIn and she was so insistent. She really, really wanted to join us, but we didn't have the capacity at the time. We're a very small company. We didn't have the, the, the time capacity nor the financial capacity to take someone on board, but she was so insisting and she was so creative in the different ways of approaching us that I was like, well, she has so much energy. Like I actually, instead of thinking it was uh, a, you know, taking my time away, I thought maybe like she will bring a lot to the company. And then, and then she she pitched um, her being uh, working with us to Women's Sports Tech, and she got funded by it. And so she joined us and for that placement time, and then she joined us uh, as an employee, and now she's pursuing a PhD. And it's this incredible opportunity that they give to women to to join companies and get an experience. And I think, you know, like a lot of um, projects in helping women. It's like mentorship and it's like, it's, it's, I'm actually really annoyed by that. Whereas giving money to people, that's exactly, you know, like we know what to do with money as women. So I absolutely love women's sports tech, uh, W-I-S-T, women's sports tech. And uh, any woman who's listening, if you want to have a placement in sports, like definitely reach out to them. They're amazing. Uh, you can reach out to me and I to you as well. And uh, yeah. Nice. And what type of like impact have you seen from it so far? Has there been you know, 50 women funded, what type of numbers could you share with us in terms of the traction there and the, and the help that's been provided? It's a good question. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, yeah. Got it. Got it. I think that the, it's such a cool initiative. I like, um, you know, going after ambitious, ambitious women and, and giving them financial resources. Cause I've talked about that multiple times on the pod in the past about, different creative ways of financing, because I think it's something like 3% of venture capital goes to women entrepreneurs. And I've talked about it at length on on the show of how different creative routes that you can go. So did you, did you fundraise for wild AI? And if so, what was that experience like? Yeah, we raised two and a half million dollars and the experience, I think it's, it, I weirdly, unlike many entrepreneurs, I, I really enjoy the fundraising times. I'm good at it. Uh, and uh, it is hard because there's a lot of no's. So obviously it puts my crit- like my self-worth and my ego to test. But as I was saying before, I 
I try to remember that it's actually something that I enjoy, like putting myself in this position where I, I will feel shame. You know, like people you re I really think would say yes and will invest they say no quite drastically. Some people say yes and they drag and drag and drag and don't invest. It's like, it is a draining exercise, but um, when it works and it has worked, it's incredible. And I have incredible investors that decided to back us. And as a founder, like the team who decides to work with us, so the people who, yeah, just, you know, it's a lot of time working for a startup and they decide to spend all these hours working with, the company and with me it's incredible it just really warms my heart and people who want to invest their money and credibility as well behind us is insane so for me it's it just um i i really try to see that as like it, it is my job and it is a fun exercise and trying to really go into this by thinking it's it's incredible like i have this incredible opportunity of being exposed to people who have done great things in their lives and might be able to invest in your company and make us like we 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 really are 100% convinced that we are changing the world. So uh, yeah, yeah. And having done a 2.5 million, could you could you walk us through some some tips for women listening to this that are thinking about timing? Because a question that I get often is when's the right time? How to be prepared both for fundraising and exits? Like they're they're pretty pretty connected in terms of the things you need to do in order to be prepared for, for both of those. So yeah. what could you share in terms of timing and how to be prepared? I, I think there's honestly never a good timing, like have a, ba a baby. I had a, a baby 11 months ago and a miscarriage before. So I was pregnant twice and there's never a good time. Like, and for fundraising, I very often start fundraising, you know, 21st of June and boom, summer is hitting or just before Christmas It's like, it's never a good time. And it takes always longer than expected. So I think right now is actually the right time. And, uh, and it's funny, I'm hearing myself say that and we are going to start fundraising. And I'm like, okay, do do what I'm preaching. You know, I, I started like a few days ago sending emails, but I have to do it now, basically. And, and there isn't a right time. And, you know, the economy is bad and whatever. And that is true, but there is money. There is still money. And so the worst that can happen is that it doesn't work out. Um, but the best that can happen is that the middle ground is like there is a little bit of money and not as much as I wanted. And the best case scenario is that there is way, like there is actually what I really needed. And so I cannot put myself in the position unless I actually try. And in terms of timing, obviously there are thresholds. Like if I get to that point, I get more value and it's important to have traction and have these numbers, et cetera. And, and we are building that, you know, I'm, I find advice, uh, I prefer to, to talk about my experience, like where I think that if we hit certain milestones, we become more valuable, et cetera. But there isn't a right time. And I fundraised just before my due date, having a baby, which is probably the worst time ever, but we needed cash. And I was telling the investors, like I have a real deadline. It's not a, you know, an artificial deadline. It's like, it's a real deadline. I'm actually having, I'm popping out a baby and <laughs> I, I do want to take a maternity. So please, you know, transfer your cash. Yeah. And some people still took longer, which is extremely annoying. And, you know, I had to, to take phone calls like a week after having a, my baby, which I do not think that is a great uh, thing from the investors. But anyways, it's also part of my job. And, and it was not a great time. So I don't think there are great times and I was reading, like, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I love these quotes, inspirational quotes. Uh, the best time, it was for trees. The best time to plant a forest was 10 years ago. The second best time is now. Um, the best time to fundraise was probably during COVID. <laughs> the second best time is now. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Doing it, doing it now and going for it. And like you said, it could be, could be longer, longer period yeah. of, of fundraising. But ultimately, there's... There's uh you know a middle ground a shoot for the moon end up in the stars kind of concept uh, with with fundraising so very cool and shifting gears a little bit after we talked a little bit about the management the women in uh, sports tech let's talk a little bit about AI I think uh, I've been following it closely it's moving at a rapid clip I mean everybody that I know is talking about it on a regular basis on a daily basis so what's your take? on the trend obviously you guys are really in the trenches like 
literally building AI. So what can you share with us about, you know, the stage of AI that you believe companies like yourself, Wild and, and other AI companies are in and where are we headed with it in terms of what we can expect over five, 10 years? You know, it's so funny because like a few months ago, everything was about Web3 to the point that I was really self-doubting. I was like, should we get into, you know, do something with blockchain and like have more data? I don't know. And then and then it went completely in dismiss and then everyone, suddenly we are cool again. <laughs> and it's so weird to think that there are these trends, these fashion trends mm -hmm. of VCs interested in investing in these technologies because either they were completely wrong, like super wrong, and Web3 was crap, or there is something there, but like, why would it, it be not interesting anymore now? And so it's really weird to see these. Like, I just I'm mind blown by you know like you have summer and winter like catch show, and then you have web free and AI VC investment interest. It's like super weird. Uh, but having said that, the good thing is like right now we are cool. So um, that's 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 good. Um, there is. I mean, there are reasons like these new huge advancements in technologies that are made available to everyone, ChatGPT, MidJourney, which are mind-blowing experiences as an individual user. And in the in the job market, we just see like so many potential changes. You know, I can cut my teams in like half, but then it's like, oh, but how do I do that? Or can I find a uh, talent that is able to like to, to take a, an, an example many people would have used, MidJourney, which is doing visual uh, mixes of your of of your like basically from text to image you write something and they, they render an image um but i i still need to understand how to prompt these images correctly so uh, can i find talent that are able to do that so that's i think where we are as as uh as ceos or as, as teams hiring talents and uh where the trend is going to go i think there will be now it's super noisy so there's this all these companies popping out from everywhere like i can replace your talents i can optimize your things uh but it is really noisy so it's very hard to know which who's going to survive who's a scam who is um well funded who is credible or who is like really uh riding on a on a uh wave of fame and what I think we'll see consideration for me personally, how we use it internally, since we've been using doing for a long time, we are running algorithms. So it's not like cutting edge AI, like me journey doing like, you know, visual or, or, or video, which is more. And I think also like in AI, what is interesting is what is very common and becomes commoditized is, is less deep tech. I give you an example. Uh, everything that is text interpretation right now, we all understand that it becomes more commoditized. So it's like, it's less mind blowing. Like, you know, when you have, um, you can do a recap, a summary of a text. It's still like impressive when you use ChatGPT, but I think it's a little bit less impressive than when we see a, a, a video of a person of my face speaking or singing a song uh, with a certain voice. That is, and this is more cutting edge AI, but Whenever it's new AI, we call it AI. Whenever it's old, we call it algorithms. So yeah. there's definitely trends and fashions. I think it's here to stay. I think it's amazing. Um, and also, like people, you know, a lot of people scare, are scared about being out out jobbed uh, with AI. But there is place. Like I personally don't have the expertise to the deep expertise to use Midjourney. So I would like, and in my team, there are people who are getting specialized as we are speaking. And I love it. Like they train me and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. But there is there is space for that. Got it. And the finale question is knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself 10 years ago? 10 years ago, I, I wish uh, I would have been more production oriented. And what I mean by that is it's so easy for us to consume Instagram and YouTube and whatever, chat GPT. I can like you know you can spend four hours talking to ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. um, great new way of spending your uh, Saturday afternoons. Um, but production is actually something that would never go away because to produce, write something, do videos, even like even creating videos, co video content for um, for a social platform actually because it compounds and the power of compounds uh, effects. So I do a little bit every day is incredible. And I think I didn't understand that enough 
back then. And I, <laughs> I'm not saying that for me back then. I'm also saying that for me right now. I, I want to have more time and dedicate myself, not, not have more time. I want to dedicate more time uh, to create more. And I've, I think that's what I would tell anyone. Well said, well said. Well, those are the questions that I have for you. Where can people learn more about Wild AI? So Wild AI, W-I-L-D dot AI is the website. We are on the app stores. You can download it. If you are a coach or working with women, you can go on wild.ai slash coach. And you can also email us, L-N-H-E-L-E-N-E at wild.ai. And on social, we are Wild AI Coach. Awesome. Awesome. Well, wherever you guys are listening on iTunes or Spotify, the links that Helen mentioned are in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you, Steve.